All right, so uh, I wanna welcome you all here and tell you that we have run a version of this before um, uh, because Suzanne Gallagher, who's one of our wonderful faculty members at Plymouth State, um, really wanted to make sure we got the news out about um, some loan information that really changed her life. So I wanna thank Suzanne for uh, bringing this back again um, and inviting Chris to present with to you all. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over um, to Suzanne. And I know at the end of this session, I'm gonna stop the recording and then uh, participants or folks here will have the chance to ask questions as well, which we will not record. So take it away, Suzanne. I'm gonna go I, briefly because, um, and I, I think I can, um, be a part of the question and answer, but I'm Suzanne Gallagher. I'm a faculty member in public health, and I am also a new committee member for our faculty union, the AAUP. So I was lucky that I got to go to the Summer Institute this summer in Burlington, where I met Chris in person. I attended his session that was titled something like um, uh, working with your students around student loans or student debt. And so it was very student oriented though. Just my observation was everybody there was a faculty member makes sense. Um, that was, that we were all, I think in debt. <laughs> um, and I got to talk with Chris personally, um, after the session, because I had rigorously, um, and, and, um, without, uh, relent, I think, um, pursued public service loan forgiveness. And during COVID, there was the special year 2022 that they let you go back in time and have other institutions that qualified for public service loan forgiveness included. Because before then, if you had consolidated or if you had done anything wrong, you had to start again at zero. And as about a month ago, um, actually since I met Chris, my student loans have been forgiven, which is amazing because they were over $100,000. And now my balance is zero. And uh, it has to do with the diligence of doing everything right and um, and the painstaking paperwork, which is hard and annoying. Um, and so I just want to be a support to anyone at all whatsoever who uh, might need a little nudge or help. And then, um, and Chris, I had gone to him after the his session and said, you know, it says that I'm negative six of my 120 qualifying payments, but it's still showing a balance. And he said, just be patient. They're really busy. And sure enough, um, as soon as, uh, you know, now right about as we're gonna need to start repaying it, the balance is showing zero. So with that, I think um, it best to turn it over to Chris uh, Goff, who, um, who is the associate director of AFT in higher ed and, and was at the um, conference or the summit this summer, um, with AAUP and AFT, the two unions as a representative has done amazing things as a change agent um, in terms of changing policy in the federal, and please correct me, Chris, when you go, if I'm getting this wrong, but has really been working for, diligently for years to um, build policy to protect students and and and, re, and graduates um, and is still con continuing to do this good work. And with that, um, I will turn it over to you. Chris. Thank you for that, Suzanne. And thank you all for having me here today. It's really exciting to be with higher education members um, who I also know are very indebted. Um, I myself also am paying off my student debt for my undergraduate and graduate school days. I am not happy about payments resuming this month. Um, and so, um, and I've also had my struggles with it. I have been in repayment for a really long time um, and I'm ready to be done. Um, but that is still a little bit down the road for me. As a union employee, I do not qualify for public service loan forgiveness, um, which is certainly an irony given the work that I do. Um, but it is also the most gratifying work that I do. So just so you know, um, I have about a 40, 45 minute presentation that I'm gonna give, and then we'll have plenty of time, um, or we won't have plenty of time. We'll have a little bit of time for questions after that, but I am going to give you a whole lot of resources. In fact, right now I'm going to drop this into the resource guide. It is a bit.ly link to a Google Drive that has our student debt clinic resource guide. Um, I can email it to folks afterwards um, to be able to distribute it to folks who signed up if you're not able to download it um, from the chat right now. Yeah. Um, Let but... me say, Chris, um, that we, uh, the CoLab will build a resource. It will have this recording and then it will have all the stuff that 
Chris supplies. So you, if you don't have to worry about tracking it, then we can send that out to everybody. You can find it right on our website, probably um, in two or three days. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Um, so, but do get that if you can have it uh, downloaded now, I do make reference to it, but I want to let you know that everything in this presentation that you see on the slide deck is in that resource guide in some form or another. Um, we try to make it so you don't have to spend your time taking notes and you can spend more time paying to the uh, attention to the presentation. And so with that, I am going to start up my PowerPoint and turn my own camera off and we will get rolling. All right. So can folks see that? Yes, it's uh, showing the, you know, yep, there, there is perfect. Perfect. All right. So I'm going to minimize this and we will get rolling. So I know that you're here today for a number of different reasons. You may be here because you or someone you know has previously struggled to make a monthly payment on a student debt. Uh, maybe you heard about different loan cancellation programs or forgiveness programs and wanted to see if you were eligible, or maybe you're just hoping to get some clarity on what's going on with all the recent changes and with payments resuming. So all across the country, people just like you um, are engaged in these same struggles, and I hope that you find today's session useful for whatever reason it is that you're here. So again, we do have question. Uh, we have time for questions at the end, but do take note of that um, email address, debtclinic at aft.org. Um, if you don't have time to answer your question today, if you don't feel comfortable asking it in front of other people, um, feel free to shoot an email to that, and we will get back with you in a relatively short order um, and be able to get you um, whatever help that you need. Um, that email address, along with everything else, is going to be on the front page of that resource guide. So we are here today to discuss programs that could help you relieve your federal student loan debt. So first, I'm gonna to briefly touch on what's going on with the broad-based debt cancellation and the recent Supreme Court decision. Next, I'm gonna cover income-driven repayment or IDR plans, which are available in some form to all federal student loan borrowers, and they may help you lower your monthly payments. Now, if you plan to pursue uh, public service loan forgiveness or PSLF for short, You'll need to be in an income-driven repayment plan when payments start for your payments to qualify. So we'll cover PSLF next. Um, and this is a program for people who work for any level of government or for a nonprofit institution. And it can lead to having the balance of your student debt forgiven after 120 on-time payments if you qualify. Finally, I'm going to talk throughout this program about SUMMER, which is a free benefit uh, for AFT members. That includes AAUP members. Um, that can help making enrolling in these programs a breeze and help you stay on top of any additional changes implemented by the Department of Education. Now, while getting you individual relief is obviously important, we also need to think about a collective response to not only ensure that these programs remain available to the people who need them, but that we also prevent future generations from finding themselves in a similar situation. <laughs> the programs we're discussing today exist because of concerted action by student loan borrowers like you, and there's still a lot of work to be done to ensure that no one finds themselves unable to escape the burden of student debt. So it's also why we're offering these debt clinics, to provide important resources and information to our members, as well as to build a stronger union so we can solve more problems inside and outside of our workplaces. So here is a little bit of context for us. There are currently over 45 million people in the United States with student debt. Now, before March of 2020, one out of every five borrowers were in default because they hadn't been able to make a payment on their student debt for more than a year. That's 9 million people. On top of that, millions more were struggling to make their monthly payments. Now, although millions of individuals are struggling under the common burden of student debt, this burden, like so many others, is an intersectional one. Student debt's bad for everyone, but on average, it's even worse if you're black, brown, older, or a woman. So students of color are more likely to borrow for their education due to the racial wealth gap. Black college graduates owe on average $25,000 more on their student loans than their white counterparts. And these same students of color are struggling to repay it after leaving school. One study found that 12 years after leaving school, the median white borrower has paid down 35% of their student debt, while the median black borrower owes 113% of their original balance. Now, women hold over 60% of outstanding federal, uh, pardon me, outstanding student loan balance in the United States. 
On average, Black women borrowed $6,000 more for their college education than white women and $8,000 more than white men. Now, while we may think of student debt as a problem affecting primarily young people, it's actually a cross-generational issue. Americans over 50 years old hold about 20% of all, out all, all outstanding federal student loan debt, and they're struggling to repay it. So for older Americans, falling behind on their student debt can have catastrophic consequences, including losing out on a portion of their social security checks. So once we put that all together, it is very clear that student debt isn't just an individual issue. Via collective action, we've made some real changes that are gonna help millions of people in the communities that have struggled the most, but there's more work to be done to ensure that no one is left behind. Now, a quick note before we dive in. I am not a financial advisor, so I'm going to be giving you an overview about how these programs work, but I'm not going to be able to give you personal financial or tax advice. So the information about how these programs work will make help you make informed financial decisions about managing your student loan debt, but you should make those decisions with your family and maybe even a financial advisor. Now, I also want to underline an important reality. To meaningfully access any of the programs that I'm going to describe here, you have to pay attention to every piece of correspondence you get from your servicer, and they need to be able to contact you. So the student loan servicing system is frustrating, and I want to name that avoiding correspondence from servicers is a normal response to that frustration. I have certainly done that. As they are currently run, these programs require a lot of recurring paperwork, though, and it's important for your servicers to be able to contact you and for you to make sure that you are reading all correspondence from them. So it's important to make sure that your email and postal addresses are up to date in your federal student aid or FSA account and with whatever servicers are yours. So you can update your information at the US Department of Education's federal student aid site, studentaid.gov. Again, all of these websites are gonna be on the front page of your resource guide. Um, you should also keep an eye on emails and regular mail correspondence from federal student aid, from your current servicer, and potentially from other student loan servicers. So finally, AFT members have access to a free member benefit called Summer that can help you better manage the paperwork, make sense of the options available to you, and keep you on track for loan forgiveness. Additionally, Summer can help AFT members gain access to other available debt relief options if income-driven repayment and PSLF aren't the right fit. Um, including options that may help with private student loans. So these may also include additional state and occupation specific options that we're not going to cover here. Um, and again, AUP members are members of the AFT, and so this is your member benefit. So the summer, um, that website is also on the front page of your resource guide. So starting with one of the more recent developments, so on June 30th of this year, the Supreme Court ruled that the Biden administration's broad-based debt cancellation of up to $20,000 of student debt under the HEROES Act was unconstitutional. So this is not just a huge disappointment to the 26 million people who applied for relief and the 16 million who'd already been approved. It's potentially catastrophic as tens of millions of borrowers are already suffering, suffering even, while payments are, um, even while payments have been paused. So we are not giving up the fight on broad-based debt cancellation. Uh, we do know that the Biden administration is pursuing other alternatives for debt cancellation, and we're vigorously advocating that they pursue all available options to prevent future economic or further economic hardship for millions of borrowers. It's also important to note that the court's ruling does not impact programs that we're talking about today. So public service loan forgiveness remains a generous option um, for AFT members and for all public service workers. And there's still an opportunity for people who've been denied PSLF in the past to get credit for their work and have their loans forgiven while we continue to work um, our work for broader cancellation. Now, whether you've been paying on your loans for a while or you just finished school or are yet to finish school, um, we're going to start this presentation at the beginning of your student loan repayment cycle. So when you leave school, um, there is a six month grace period during which you're not required to make any payments on your student loans. Once that grace period ends, you are automatically placed in the 10 year standard repayment plan. So this repayment plan is something like a fixed mortgage. The way they figure out how much you pay is simply how much would you have to pay every month to pay off your debt in 10 years. So that's the default plan. 
Um, but the default is not the right fit for many people, especially if you're trying to reach PSLF. So in addition to the 10-year standard repayment plan, there are many other types of repayment plans out there. So the people who are supposed to help you navigate the system are called student loan servicers. Um, so many of you have heard of Ed Financial, Advantage, Nelnet, Mohila, or Great Lakes, among others. That's your student loan servicer. Um, they are the people who are sending out bills this week and who you'll be remitting payment to um, in the months ahead. Now, it is not uncommon for accounts to be transferred between servicers, and some servicers are even leaving the student loan servicing business, which often causes additional confusion for borrowers as accounts are tra being transferred. It's important to make sure your contact information is regularly updated um, and that you pay attention to correspondence from your servicers for these notices. So loan servicers have been known to give confusing information about repayment plans and have sometimes steered borrowers into plans, deferments, or forbearances that left the borrower worse off. We're going today, today we're going to focus on the four income-driven repayment plans that are best for most people and are part of the requirements for public service loan forgiveness. So income-driven repayment and PSLF are free to enroll in and you should never pay someone to enroll you in them. There are thousands of scam companies that will charge hundreds of dollars to do this a little bit of paperwork for you, and you should not pay them. So if you're contacted by one of these companies that wants to charge you, we recommend filing a complaint with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and letting them know about this. They're operating in a gray area in the market, um, and they have often done, they have done some things that have left some borrowers um, really badly off. So do not pay anyone to enroll you in these and report anyone that's trying to um, make them fuck off you to do a little bit of paperwork for you. So income driven repayment plans are repayment plans that base your monthly payment on your adjusted gross income and on your family size rather than on how much you owe. Your payments to these plans can be as low as $0 a month and these plans can even cancel your remaining student debt in as soon as 10 and after no more than 25 years, regardless of where you work. So these repayment plans and forgiveness programs are for federal student loans, which make up about 90% of all student loans today. Well, there's a few different types of federal student loans and which type you have will vary depending primarily on when you took out your loan and on whether you took it out for yourself or for a dependent. What matters though, is that it is a federal student loan. So in general, there's four buckets of these loans, direct federal family education loans, Perkins loans, and parent plus loans. Um, if you have one of those types of loans, you should qualify for at least one of the repayment plans that we're discussing today and have access to PSLF. Now, unfortunately, private student loans are not gonna be covered by any of the things that we're discussing today. Now, if you're not sure whether your loans are private or federal, check the loan name on your monthly bill, log on to your FSA account, or call your servicer and ask whether your loan is a federal loan and what kind of loan it is. So the Summer Student Loan Tool can be used to determine which loans are federal and which are private. Now, before I jump into the details about income-driven payment plans, there are a few things that I need to define that are gonna have an impact on how much you pay. So the first of these is discretionary income. So discretionary income is the difference between your adjusted gross income and either 150% or 225% of the poverty guideline for your family size, depending on the repayment plan that you select. So said another way, anything you bring in that's over 150% or 225% of the poverty guideline is your discretionary income. So your discretionary income is calculated based on what you're reporting to the IRS as your adjusted gross income. So that means that any income going towards pre-tax items like health insurance premiums shouldn't appear in the income used to determine what you pay every month. So the next definition is family size. So when it comes to these repayment plans, your family size may be different from the number of exemptions you claim on your federal income tax return, or the number of dependents you have as defined by the IRS. So family size will always include you, your spouse, if you file your taxes jointly, 
and your children if you are covering more than 50% of their living expenses. It does not matter where they live. It will also include unborn children who are going to be born during the year for which you're certifying your income. We'll talk a little bit more about this certification um, in a minute. Now, for all the IDR plans that we're discussing today, family size also includes other people. For example, older family members, if they live with you now, receive more than half their support from you now, and will continue to receive the support for the year that you certify your family size. So remember those terms, and now we're gonna talk a little bit more about the income-driven repayment plans. If you wanna follow along in the resource guide, these are gonna be on page, listed on page two. So the Department of Education currently has four of these repayment plans, and these plans exist on a continuum with save uh, slash repay being the most generous and income contingent repayment being the least generous plans. And they have differences in several areas, um, how your discretionary income is calculated, what percentage of your discretionary income you pay, whether there is a cap on your payments, how long you'll pay for, and what kind of loans you can have to qualify for each kind of IDR plan. Most of this is explained in the chart on page two. And if you sign up for the summer member benefit, they're also going to be able to assess all these factors and recommend the IDR plan that is best for you. However, I do wanna go into a little more additional detail about the newest income driven repayment plan, the saving on a valuable education or save plan. So this new plan will replace revised pay as you earn. And if you're currently enrolled in revised pay as you earn, you'll automatically be transitioned to the new save plan. Now for the next several months, the Department of Education and loan servicers may use the terms repay and save interchangeably. Regardless of what they call it, the details that I'm describing will be the same. So the changes in the save program will bring significant savings to borrowers. Some changes were implemented on July 30th of 2023, while others will be put in place next year on July 1st. So the following changes are currently in place. So first, discretionary income will be counted using 225% of the federal poverty guideline instead of 150%, um, which is what's used in most of the other plans. So this more generous, more generous calculation of discretionary income means that less of your money is on the table to determine your monthly payment and your monthly payment will be lower. So under save, any unpaid monthly interest will not be capitalized back into your principal, meaning that in this payment plan, you will not see your loan balance grow due to unpaid interest. So for all of the income driven repayment plans, not just save, but all four plans, Married borrowers will be able to exclude their spouse's income in determining their monthly payment if they file their taxes separately. However, they're also going to have to exclude the spouse as part of their family size if they do that. So this change is a small step back for a small number of borrowers in um, income contingent repayment, IBR, and pay as you earn, but is it a big improvement for those who have been enrolled in repay slash save, and it's going to benefit all borrowers by making it easier to recertify their income. So borrowers who enroll in IDR plans using the Department of Education's platform and who opt into accessing their income data electronically through that platform are going to be able to have their incomes recertified automatically, which will make a lot of this a lot easier. So here are the changes to save that will occur on July 1st of next year. So the monthly payment is going to drop from 10% of your discretionary income to 5% of your discretionary income if, it's only, if your loans are just undergraduate loans. If you have loans from grad school, your monthly payment will be a weighted average of your loans using 5% for your undergrad loans and 10% for grad loans. Now, for borrowers who have borrowed up to $12,000, any outstanding balance will be canceled after 120 payments. For each additional $1,000 borrowed, another 12 payments will be required up to a maximum payment period of 20 years for just undergraduate loans and 25 years if you have graduate loans. Now, unfortunately, this new payment plan will not be available to borrowers with Parent PLUS loans. 
Um, if it gives you a sense of how good this plan is, I actually changed uh, my income driven repayment plan to the save plan and I'm saving a significant amount of money on my monthly payment. Um, so this is, um, I can say unequivocally, the best plan that's available to most borrowers right now. Now, I know that I just threw a lot of information at you. So I wanna go through an example so you can kind of see how this all works. So this is Anna, and Anna is a new teacher who has an adjusted gross income of $46,000. She is married and has two children, so she has a family size of four. She's a recent college graduate with direct loans totaling $37,000. Now, under a 10-year standard repayment plan, Anna would be expected to pay $353 every month. What we're gonna do now is do the math to figure out how much she'd pay under the new save plan, the most favorable income driven repayment plan that she is eligible for. So we'll start with Anna's adjusted gross income of $46,000. Now for a family of four, 225% of the poverty line is $67,500. So we are going to subtract that amount from her adjusted gross income. Um, because that amount is a negative number, her discretionary income is $0. So I hope you can see where we're going with this. Um, because she's eligible for the SAVE plan, which currently has a payment amount of 10% of her discretionary income, we'd multiply her discretionary income by 10%. Um, which will give us an annual payment of zero dollars. Um, to get the monthly payment, we have to divide that by 12, which of course will give us a monthly payment of zero dollars. Um, now, as her income increases, assuming that her family size stays the same, um, even if her income increases you know, dramatically until it surpasses $67,500, um, she's going to have a $0 monthly payment. Um, and the federal um, poverty guidelines are usually adjusted upwards every year. Um, so that amount will keep kind of moving up. So she could be enjoying um, several years of $0 payments, um, which is great. Now, I'm not expecting you to do the math to figure out your own situation. On page three of the resource guide, we include a couple of grids so you can get a sense of what you might be paying and the two most generous repayment plans that are available. Just so you know, that bottom number on each of the graphs um, is a function of how much space we had on the graph. There is no income maximum um, that where they say, oh, you don't qualify for an income-driven repayment plan anymore. Um, it's basically... Um, based on, uh, it's your debt to income ratio. There are doctors living somewhere near you um, who have, uh, are making $250,000 a year, who have three quarters of a million dollars in medical school debt who qualify for an income driven repayment plan. Susan asked a very good question. Do those $0 payments count as on-time monthly payments towards PSLF? They absolutely do. You will get a bill every month for $0. You do not have to do anything. Um, and not doing anything will qualify you. Um, that'll be a month of payments towards PSLF. Um, so every year, every month of a $0 payment is a payment towards PSLF um, to be counted at the end. So here are a couple things to keep in mind um, about income driven repayment as you uh, think about enrolling in them. So first of all, it is necessary to certify your income every year. Um, so this is going to be a lot easier um, to do now with the automatic certification process, um, but just in case you're not doing that, for people have lots of reasons um, for not opting in to the digital income certification. Um, if you don't opt into that, um, your servicer will send you an email or letter um, saying that you need to recertify your income, but you should also note the date on your own calendar when you've been enrolled in the plan, so you're on the lookout for that notification. Now, if you don't recertify your income um, before that deadline, you're going to be charged what you pay in the 10-year standard repayment plan. But as I mentioned, um, one of the recently announced changes is going to make this recertification process easier. If you enroll in IDR using the Department of Education's website, studentaid.gov slash IDR, and you authorize federal student aid to digitally obtain your income data and family size from the IRS, you're gonna be able to recertify your IDR eligibility automatically. Um, 
we're still waiting to hear kind of the process, but I think it might be simple, like something that they just notify you that it's been updated. Um, but we're learning more about it, but it is going to, one of the big things um, that has been a problem is that people forget the recertification. Um, they never, like, they or uncertify out of the program and never get back in. And so by making this change, um, they're hoping that people are able to, the paperwork won't be a problem and people will continue to have those manageable payments. Now, the other important thing, anytime your income declines and anytime your family size increases, you should recertify your income immediately so you have that extra financial flexibility that you need. You do not have to wait a whole year to recertify for a lower payment. Now, I want to make a specific note about income contingent repayment for those of you who may have Parent PLUS loans. Now, unfortunately, Parent PLUS loan borrowers are in a less favorable situation than people who borrowed for their own education. The only IDR plan um, that Parent PLUS loan borrowers are eligible for is income contingent repayment, which everyone else will want to avoid. Um, ICR is the least generous to borrowers, and it generally means that more of your money is on the table for loan payments. For Parent PLUS loan holders, you will have to consolidate your Parent PLUS loans and to direct loans to access this payment plan. For many Parent PLUS loan borrowers, ICR payments may be more than what you'd pay in a 10-year standard repayment plan. So we recommend using the Federal Student Aid Repayment Calculator to see what your monthly payment may be before applying. If you are considering consolidating your Parent PLUS loans, be sure to do so before December 30th of 2023 so that you do not reset your payment account. Now, that uh, December 31st, 2023 deadline is important because through that period, the Department of Education is reviewing all federal student loan accounts to determine the number of payments that have been made. And this number will be applied towards the year of payment for cancellation under an IDR plan and towards the 10 years of payments for PSLF. So months in repayment where the borrower was not in default, including periods in any repayment plan, in extended periods of forbearance or deferment, and in any period of deferment prior to 2013, excluding in-school deferments, should be counted as a monthly payment. So this account adjustment will cover borrowers with direct loans, including Parent PLUS loans, and non-commercially held FELL loans. It does not cover commercially held FELL loans, but those loans can be counted if they are consolidated before December 31st, 2023. Now, if your loans have been paused during the pandemic, they already qualify for the IDR account adjustment. If you've been required to make payments on your federal student loans during the pandemic payment pause, you have a commercially held FELL loan and should consolidate into a direct loan before December 31st, 2023 to take advantage of the account adjustment. Now, borrowers with non-commercially held FELL loans qualify for the IDR account adjustment, but you still need to consolidate that loan into a direct loan to qualify for PSLF. If you've applied for PSLF, your payment count will be um, adjusted automatically. If you've yet to apply for PSLF, we encourage you to apply as soon as possible to receive credit for your payments. Now, borrowers who have been in repayment the longest are going to see their account adjustments first. Um, I know the first group were announced actually last in uh, August. Um, while newer borrowers should expect to see that adjustment hit their accounts uh, in early 2024. Now, if you have not been previously enrolled in an IDR plan, you should apply as soon as possible so that you're in the best plan for when payments resume. So you can apply online at Federal Student Aid um, at uh, studentaid.gov slash IDR. Before you complete your application there, you're gonna be able to use the FSA repayment calculator to see what your monthly payments will be to ensure that you can afford them before committing to enrolling. You can also use the summer platform that's available for free to AFT and AAUP members. So summer can help you also help you figure out what plans you're eligible for and what you pay in each plan before you enroll. And they can help you, um, you can fill out the application using their website as well. Finally, you do have the option of using a paper application. You can request that from your servicer or we've included a link to the PDF on the front page of the resource guide. And as a reminder, do not pay anyone to enroll you in these plans. And if you're approached by a company that wants to charge you, we recommend filing a complaint with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. 
So what are the implications of income-driven repayment plans? So we'll start with the negative ones. The first, depending on when you reach the loan cancellation under an IDR plan, you may be required to pay income tax on the amount forgiven. So through 2025, the law is that this forgiveness is not federally taxable, but your state may treat this imputed income differently. After 2025, um, your guess is as good as mine. Um, there's a lot of exemptions for determining if the amount forgiven will be treated as taxable income. And you should talk to a financial or tax advisor to see what your situation may be and how to prepare for it. If you're pursuing PSLF, however, that forgiveness happens tax-free. There is no tax bill associated with it. Now, second, you may also wind up paying more in interest under these plans than under the 10-year standard repayment plan because the repayment period is extended up to 20 to 25 years instead of just 10 years. So this problem has been improved by the new SAVE plan for giving unpaid interest, but borrowers in ICR, IBR, and pay as you earn will still accrue interest. Even if you are accruing interest though, if you're going to qualify for PSLF, this is more of a paper problem than the real one. Um, the interest is going to be forgiven along with everything else, uh, but some borrower, borrowers and those plans find it very unnerving to see their balances grow. So if you know that you will be a borrower um, who does have a, um, doesn't want to see that, um, you might want to factor that into your assessment of these options. Now let's talk about the pros. So first of all, IDR plans are like a social safety net for student loans. You can always pay more than the minimum payment and pay off your loan earlier, but in months where something unexpected happens, you'll have more flexibility. However, paying more than required is generally not a good idea if you're pursuing public service loan forgiveness. If you're paying more than the minimum, you're giving back um, to the government what could be forgiven at the end of 10 years. These plans are also better for most borrowers than a deferment or forbearance. So a deferment or forbearance suspends your payments, but it does not count as a monthly payment towards loan cancellation or forgiveness. And any interest accrued while you're in a forbearance or deferment will be added to your principal once you resume repayment. Now, if your adjusted gross income is low enough, um, either because of a lower income or because of it, you're out of work or someone else in your household is, or because you have a relatively high number of family members, you'd be asked to pay $0 a month in any income-driven repayment plan, and that will count as an on-time payment and moving towards the eventual loan discharge. It's also important to note that the COVID payment pause granted to student loan borrowers from March 2020 um, through the end of this month is not a traditional deferment or forbearance, even if your servicer is calling it a COVID deferment. If your payments have been paused, you have not been accumulating interest, and very importantly, each paused month has counted towards any eventual loan cancellation under an income-driven repayment plan and towards public service loan forgiveness. Um, that means a lot of people um, have about 40 months of payments um, without having done anything over the last three and a half years, um, a third of the way there to public service loan forgiveness um, without having done anything. The final pro that I'm gonna mention before moving into the next section is that these repayment plans are necessary to qualify for PSLF and they work in tandem. So you're gonna pay as little as possible and get the maximum forgiveness on your loans if you're enrolled in one of these repayment plans um, as early in your repayment cycle as possible. So what is public service loan forgiveness? It is a federal program that could allow you to have the balance of your direct loans forgiven after 10 years tax-free. So PSLF isn't a repayment plan like a save or pay as you earn. It is a separate program that incentivizes a career in the public service. So to qualify for the program, you need to do the following after October 1st, 2007. That is the first month that public service loan forgiveness began. You need to make 120 qualifying on-time payments or 10 years worth towards your federal student loans and you need to be working in the public service for at least 30 hours a week. And you're able to combine multiple part-time public service jobs to meet that requirement. Once you make your 120th payment, um, you can apply to have the Department of Education forgive your remaining federal student loan debt. So in general, to qualify for PSLF, you must answer yes to the following five questions at the same time for all 120 payments. So the first question is, do you work in the public service? 
So public service means that you work in the public sector or for a qualifying nonprofit. Uh, to put it another way, it doesn't matter what you do, just who employs you. So nearly um, every member of the AFT is employed in public service. So qualifying public service employers can be any level of government, federal, state, county, municipal, or tribal, includes all public school districts, public and nonprofit hospitals, and public and private nonprofit institutions of higher education. If you're employed and paid by any level of government or by a 501c3 nonprofit institution, you should meet this requirement. Your job title is not relevant. It does not matter what you do. It only matters who employs you. So next, do you work full time? So to qualify for PSLF, you must work full time. This is defined as at least 30 hours a week for at least eight months of the year. You're able to combine hours from multiple public service employers to meet this requirement. To do that, you'll need to get an employment certification form uh, completed by each qualifying employer. And if you're trying to use multiple jobs to cover overlapping periods of time, send those applications in together. Now, it's very important to note that you must still be working full time in public service when you submit your final PSLF application. I make a habit of telling people, do not quit your public service job until you have loan forgiveness in hand. The technical rule is um, when you certify your last month of employment and send in that final application, you still need to be working in public service then. Now, for those of you who work as adjunct professors, there's some additional information that I wanna pass on to ensure that you receive credit for all the hours you are entitled to when you certify your employment. So starting on July 1st of this year, for the purposes of public service loan forgiveness, the US Department of Education has put in place new regulations that state your school must multiply each course contact hour by a minimum of 3.35 to determine the total hours worked in each term. And that means that teaching three, three credit courses in a term would allow you to be certified as full-time. So you can apply this multiplier back to when the PSLF program began um, in October of 2007. Um, Suzanne, I'm gonna get to your question there um, in a moment. So third, does your student loan qualify? So only direct loans are eligible for PSLF. So if you started borrowing to attend college after 2010, most, if not all your loans are likely direct loans, which means that they qualify as is for PSLF. You don't need to take any further action on them that way. Likewise, parent plus loans are a form of direct loan and qualify as is for PSLF. Now, if you currently have a Fell or a Perkins loan now, you're gonna to need to consolidate them into a direct consolidation loan before payments made towards them will qualify for PSLF. You can consolidate these loans at studentaid.gov or through summer, and the process takes about 30 minutes to fill out the application. Now, if you consolidate your loans before December 30th, pardon me, December 31st, 2023, your new consolidated loan will carry the payment count of the unconsolidated loan with the highest number of payments. If you consolidate Bell or Perkins loans after the deadline, the payment count is gonna be reset to zero on the new loan. So question number four, does your repayment plan qualify? So only the four income-driven repayment plans that we discussed in the previous section and the 10-year standard repayment plan qualify for PSLF. Now, of the loans that do qualify, you do not want to be in the 10-year standard repayment plan if you're pursuing PSLF. If you make 10 years of on-time payments under that repayment plan, you'll have paid off your loan and have nothing left to forgive. That said, if you do end up making a few payments in the default 10-year plan, those payments will count towards the 120 total payments, but you can start saving money on qualifying payments as soon as possible by enrolling in an IDR plan um, now. Now, for Parent PLUS loan borrowers, again, you are currently only eligible for two of the qualifying repayment plans, the 10-year standard repayment and ICR, the least generous IDR plan. If the ICR plan is the better option, you're going to need to consolidate the Parent PLUS loan into a direct consolidation loan before applying, 
and you should consolidate before December 31st, 2023 to ensure that you retain all your payments. Now, again, you still have an opportunity to have previous payments on any federal loan made in any repayment plan while working in public service counted towards your PSLF total when you apply if you consolidate your Fell and Perkins loans before December 31st, 2023. Finally, do your payments qualify? So to have your loans forgiven, you have to make 120 qualifying on-time payments. This means that once you receive your bill, you should pay the exact amount of the payment within 15 days of the due date. So the Department of Education, as I mentioned before, is in the process of reviewing student loan accounts to give borrowers an accurate count of payments that qualify for PSLF and for IDR cancellation. So in addition to counting any time that you are in repayment, um, they are also going to count previous periods of forbearance and deferment that either exceeded 12 months consecutively or 36 months cumulatively as qualifying payments. Again, if you consolidate any unconsolidated Fell or Perkins loans before December 31st and you apply for PSLF, you're gonna be able to see those periods applied to your total payment count in 2024. Again, if you've already applied for PSLF, your account is gonna be updated automatically. Now, here are some of the more commonly asked questions that we get asked. Um, first of all, these 120 payments do not need to be consecutive. Um, if you were to make 100 qualifying payments and then you missed a month, you don't start over, the next qualifying payment would be counted as number 101. So that means if you leave public service, but you come back to it later and want to uh, continue pursuing PSLF, you can pick up right where you left off. This works retroactively as well. You can always certify for past payments made on a direct loan, including Parent PLUS loans, in an income-driven repayment plan. And under the current rules, payments made on Fell loans and Perkins loans under any repayment plan can also be counted when you apply for PSLF if you consolidate your loans before December 31st, 2023. So once you've made 120 qualifying payments and are ready for forgiveness, you can complete one final certification through the forgiveness application. When your loan's forgiven, do let us know. We do wanna be able to share your story so that more people know that loan forgiveness is possible. So how do you certify? Um, so you're gonna need to submit the PSLF application. So before you begin, you should get two pieces of information. First, you're gonna need your employer's federal employer identification number or EIN. You can find that on your W-2 form or simply call your employer and ask for it. You're also going to need to know who at your employer can complete and sign the part of the application the employer is responsible for, which is sections three and four on page two of the form. Uh, we recommend contacting your employer's HR department about where to submit the form, including the name, email, and telephone number of the person responsible for completing the form. You're going to need all those pieces of information. So you and your employer can complete all the PSLF application online using the PSLF help tool at studentaid.gov slash PSLF. So as you complete your portion of the application, um, as I mentioned before, you're going to need to provide the correct email address for an authorizing official to receive an email requesting they certify your employment and digitally to sign the form. So tell your employer to expect an email sent from DocuSign on behalf of the Department of Education's Office of Federal Student Aid. Once your employer certifies and signs that form, it will be electronically submitted to Mohila, which is the only servicer who handles PSLF accounts for processing. So you will be able to track the progress of the application on your studentaid.gov dashboard by clicking the View All Activity um, link under the My Activity tab. You can also use the free Summer Student Loan app to apply. If you use Summer, you're going to need to complete the online portion of the application and get the form to your employer. So Summer can also send the form directly to your employer to complete digitally. However, some employers don't accept applications from third-party apps like Summer. If your employer doesn't, you can request a PDF copy of the application to submit to your employer from hello at meetsummer.org. If the form is completed digitally um, by your employer, it will be sent back to Summer, who will then send it on to Mohila for processing. 
However, if you have to have that form completed manually, um, you can email it back to Summer uh, to forward on to Mohila, or you can send it directly to Mohila yourself. The information about where to send the form is on page four of the application. Um, you do have to mail or fax the form the first time you send it to Mohila if you're doing it on your own, but after um, you have an account with them, you're gonna be able to update it or uh, upload it to them automatically. So do note that no matter how you initially certify, we recommend filing your PSLF application at least once a year. So you can do this along with your annual recertification for IDR if that's um, a useful thing for you. So sending in the PSLF application is the only way that you are able to receive an updated count on your qualifying payment. So if you're sending it in every year, you should see that payment count go up by 12. If it's not, you know there's an issue you need to contact your servicer about. After you make 120 payments, you submit the PSLF application one final time. Um, so receiving updated payment counts and loan forgiveness is an exercise in patience. In the best of circumstances, it may take up to eight weeks to process your application and notify you of your payment count. Um, however, we are not in the best of circumstances. Um, Student loan servicers were woefully underprepared for the number of applications that they had coming um, over the past year, and they are woefully unprepared for student loan repayment to resume. Um, so this is just my way of saying you need to be patient. Things are moving. Um, as you heard from Susan, people are having their loans forgiven, but it's taking a lot longer than that. Um, and we are working to address some of those things with the Department of Education um, because a lot of people are kind of on tenterhooks about this. Finally, we do recommend keeping track of everything. Um, print out or store the emails that they send you. If you have a conversation with a servicer, ask them for written verification of what they're telling you. We recommend keeping your own track of payments, either using your bank records um, or cleared checks. PSLF is only as effective as the people um, who carry the program out, and you should expect that you're gonna have to hold them accountable and having um, your documents in a row can help with that. So you're gonna be able to find and share everything that I covered here today on our companion website that we host with our friends at the Student Borrower Protection Center, um, www.cancelmystudentdebt.org. Um, if you have friends, family, colleagues who might find this information useful, send them to that link. Um, it also has really detailed instructions about how to fill out those applications. If you could use a kind of a written or video guide about how to do that. Um, this and all the other uh, resources that you see on the slide um, are on the front page of the resource guide. Finally, because you're AFT members, you can enroll in summer. Um, and the first step you need to do that is you need to create a free AFT member benefits account. On the very last page of the resource guide, we've included some instructions for how to create that account. Um, once you do that and you log in to the member only benefits area, you'll see the link for summer and simply click on that. I've also included um, summer's um, borrower support links, uh, emails there. Those are also on the front page of your resource guide. Um, once you create an account with them, they're often the best people to talk to um, about either the platform or what you're seeing. Obviously, if you have other questions, if you have trouble accessing Summer, um, use that, that clinic at aft.org email address. Um, we try to get back to you within 24 hours, um, certainly no longer than 48. Um, but those are the resources that are available to you um, with that. And so that includes our portion of the presentation. We do have a little bit of time uh, for some questions here. Um, so thank you all. That's a lot of information. Um, thank you so much, Chris. I'm going to start by stopping recording so that we can have a little more privacy um, for the Q&A session. So hold on one sec.